Okay, hi, Bruce. Lionel, are you down in the dumps, my friend? <laughs> yeah, actually, I just, I just, wait a minute, I just saw a comment from somebody saying one of our podcasts, we started out, I was kind of testy. Testy? Yeah, I think I'm testy on testy. every, yeah, I think I'm testy on every podcast. Well, you got to keep up with the uh, tradition, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like the, the, the nerve of somebody to point it out, that's kind yeah. of somewhat yeah. disconcerting. Yeah, like it's kind of obvious. Like it's like telling me I got, it's like telling me I got great hair and a beautiful profile. Like that's kind of well, obvious too. Well, ex exactly. Um, but, but yet you don't see him commenting on that. No, yeah, exactly. There's no comments <laughs> about that, is there? Yeah, come on, eh? Seriously. Uh, let me see if I can find that. I'm gonna look really, really quick. Hang on, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. Uh, there it is, I think. Virtual Hobby Shop. My, yeah, Virtual Hobby Shops. My favorite shows. This is from Ken Ziska. A little cranky at the start, but it mellowed out as it was a great deal of fun. <laughs> a little cranky at the start. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Spoon, I offered to make a little bet with Lionel about the Caboose Project. He knew better than to take me up on it. Oh. A little cranky at the start. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah. I think I'm just cranky all the time. Oh, well. uh, when you're the evil overlord, you don't have to be cheerful. Exactly. You don't even have to show up. You don't, no. Um, you, do you, when you're evil overlord, you can do whatever you please. Exactly. Like if you want to take the 1014 train out of Aurora, Illinois, that's the one you take. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, so before we go forward, though, can we just double check? Is this the first podcast since the last podcast? It is indeed. And do you do you not think uh, after after this amount of time we should do some sort of audit about that? Uh, we could call in the Acme Auditing Company and uh, see uh, what their rates may be and have them run through it. Yeah, I think we just need to audit, make sure that. Or, we are... or, or you know, something we could do. We could like crowdsource it to uh, the AML Facebook page and fans of AML and ask them for their input. Yeah, that's a good idea. Crowdsourcing, I like that. That's another one of those new hip words. That's one of those hip words. That's what all the hip kids. Yeah, yeah, we're crowd, we're crowdsourcing it, man. Yeah, 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 yeah man. We'll crowdsource what? it. What? It sounds like Martin. <laughs> yeah, Toby <laughs> like uh, Gillis or something. I know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so tonight Maynard we're Grib. who Maynard Maynard Ma Maynard T Gribs or whatever yeah, they yeah yeah Maynard T something or other. It was Gribs or something. Or oh. Gribs or uh, we'll ask our what was that? Show? Oh, Dobie Gillis was the show. Dobie Gillis. Yeah, now there's yeah, a blast. That's, from the uh, that was the guy who played Gilligan played Maynard. Yeah, that was before everything. That was before the uh, Dick Van Dyke show. That was before Get Smart, Green Acre. That was before everything, Dobie Gillis. Yep. That was on at the same time as I Love Lucy, I think. Lucy. You got some splaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> Fred and Ethel. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Apparently Fred was a lush. Oh really? Yeah, in real life he was a heavy drinker. Huh. And uh when Des when uh what was the guy's name? Uh Desi. What was his name? Desi, Desi Arnaz. Yeah, when Desi Arnaz hired him, he said, Is this gonna be a problem? And he said it'll never be a problem and it never was. Huh, there you go. Yeah. Uh um, But Ethel she was real eye candy. Yeah, I, Ethel was like well, she was supposed to not be. But, <laughs> um but she seemed like quite a nice lady. She did. She was always got Lucy's back. Yeah, that's right. Lucy, you got some explaining to do. Uh, okay, so tonight we're going to talk, to, uh, and we were going to have our pal uh, Mike the Spoon Oster tag here, but for some reason he's missing in action. Uh, uh -oh. So tonight we're going to interview a guy named Tim Garland, who I first met when uh, Scott Thornton over there at Proto Throttle wanted to do a show about Proto Throttle, and we had uh, Tom Klamoski. Mm -hmm. Tim Garland, and another guy, who I'm sure Tim will remember. And anyways, we did this show about uh, about the Proto Throttle, 
uh, with Scott Thornton. And uh, these guys were some of the very, very first users of it. Tim was one of the very, very first users of it. Yeah. Do, do you think Scott's going to sell like more than 50 of them? I don't know, you know, like, uh, yeah, it's like, I, I'm convinced over there he's just nothing but dead weight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, he came up with the idea, but now and now Mike Peterson and Michael Peterson and Nathan Holmes are just kind of stuck with this guy, like, you know, dragging a cement block on a long walk. <laughs> uh, so anyways, we're going to talk to Tim Garland, who lives in Georgia, and he's a Norfolk Southern engineer. Oh, sweet. So, spoon would have been perfect. I know. A spoon would have been perfect for this gig, but it's up to you and me now to ask all the hard-hitting questions. Hard-hitting questions. Well, you know, something I'll give the old college a try. All right. So rather than send you down the deep, dark, dark, dark Hey, damp, hey, hey. You know something? What? Check on your desk there. Wh why? See that nice, the nice, big, shiny red buzzer button? Yeah, you just hit that? That's connected right to the green moon and sets off a little buzzer and light in there to... <laughs> It says, come on down. Okay, Tim, come on in. I'm here. There you go. There you go. Happy to be here. How do you like our green room? Oh, I love it. Oh, really? And from my point of wow, view, it's kind of bluish, though. Yeah. <laughs> color, color uh, there's some sort, of, some sort of funk on the walls from various uh, things we're not sure of. So, yeah, it was, green at, it was green at one time. You didn't eat the shrimp, did you? No, 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 no. You had a no, boy. I, I did have the I did have the chicken wings though the hot wings were pretty good. <laughs> There's yeah. wings in there now. That's news to me. Yeah, cool. yeah, they were good. I wonder if they're old shrimp that they're... look like wings. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I'll let you know in the morning. Yeah, you will, and yeah. you'll let us no, know. We should, we should get. We should just put a big bucket of cheese balls in there. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Those uh, Utes, what are the Yutes cheese balls? They last yutz, forever. Yutz, the the oh, big yes. bucket of Yutes cheese balls. Yeah, the, the big bucket of Yutes cheese balls. All right, so Tim, who was the the third guy that was on that show with us? It was you and Tom Klamoski and Scott Thornton and somebody else. Joe Atkinson. Joe Atkinson. Oh, yes, he models the Iowa Interstate. Yeah. He was probably ah. the first uh, beta tester that uh, Scott gave a throttle to, so he has one of the original throttles. I I came a little later, so mine was a more updated version. And do you have one now? Yes. Do you have like a half a dozen of them? No, but uh, I I plan on getting another one. I do I do want to. I I'm the way I look at it. I'd I'd gladly sell uh, two of my uh, locomotives that I have. That's just surplus locomotives sitting in a box on a shelf to buy another proto throttle. It's worth that much to me. So Excellent. so how did you how did you get involved with proto throttling? Well, uh, it started on the uh, MRH forum. They, uh, I guess Scott had uh, brought this up. And uh, so we were given a lot of feedback. And since I was mentioning that I was a locomotive engineer on the forum and given my feedback, uh, Scott approached me uh, and asked me if I wanted to be a beta tester for the product. And shoot, yes, I ju jumped at the chance. And so I was able to um, give him and also Michael Peterson some feedback on the, uh, what I thought would make the throttle, uh, the throttle a little more realistic, and they uh, they hit this one out of the park, in my opinion. Oh yeah, for sure. Michael Peterson's a nice guy. Eh? Okay. Yeah, he is. He is. He's he's a pretty cool guy. He's a real nice gentleman. What's the deal with that Scott Thornton though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Me neither. I don't know either. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, he was convinced he was barely going to sell any of these things. Yeah, to me, it's one of those uh, advancements in the hobby that uh, for those who appreciate it, it's just like when uh, sound came on the scene. And I can remember way, way back when I first uh, heard my first sound-equipped locomotive and thinking, wow, this is just brings a whole new dimension to the hobby that we haven't had before. And, uh, and, and the... Pro throttle is a lot like that. It just seems like it, it's another layer, another dimension that adds a lot more realism to what we're doing. And it operates so well, too. You can definitely make it operate a lot like the real thing. Um, for me, I prefer uh, the way it's set up. It, it works better in a yard-type setting where you're switching or, or you're working locals or some industry work. Um, but you can use it on the main line. There's 
Um, but as far as just work, using the proto throttle, like I would use a the real thing, the real locomotive, it's it reminds me a lot of how I would be switching cars around in a yard. Uh, that's more so than anything. Can you? Yeah, so you can still get the same feels then as running a, a, a unit. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Oh. Hello. 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 <laughs> ask, ask that question again, there, Bruce. Yeah, do you I, get I'm the not same anything feeling? Bruce is saying. You're not hearing oh, anything really? Bruce is saying. No, I Uh-oh. can hear you perfect, but I can't hear anything Bruce is saying. Well, how is that huh. possible? I don't know. I don't know. I hear Bruce fine. I'm going to try to go with him. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. How soon can you land? I can't tell. You can tell me I'm a doctor. No, I mean, I'm just not sure. Or can't you take a guess? Well, not for another two hours. You can't take a guess for another two hours? Okay, so when last we left our hero... (laughs) 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 We've actually had... How much time has passed? Almost an hour? (laughs) Almost an hour. We're in like a room delay. Yeah, we were in the room, and then in, in a manner of panic, I put out, Is there, if there's anybody out there, get in the room, because Tim could only hear me, and he couldn't hear Bruce. So then Ralph come running in with a fire extinguisher. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the problem? Where's the problem? So now we've, we're, we've uh, uh, Ralph Renzetti, Ralphie Boy, has joined us for the rest of the exciting interview. Tim, you've got your, you're using your son's computer now. Uh, yeah, his mega computer in his room. Yeah, this is oh, that's a trick. A, that's a good sound. You got beautiful sound. <laughs> yes. So there's something. Uh, so did you toss your laptop out the window yet? I that's what I told him. I said I'm about to throw this laptop out the window. I'm <laughs> done with it. <laughs> and, and he said, "Yeah, what's taking us so long?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Give me your password. I'm logging on to your computer." <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? Right. I, I like that. Thank yeah, you. give me your yeah. password. He's not, out. He's yeah, out. I use it. <laughs> yeah, he's out right now. So okay, well, and, and he just gave it to you, no problem. Yeah, he knew I was desperate. <laughs> that a boy. Um, okay, so when we just when we last left our hero, and Ralph, anytime you have a question, uh, you know the drill. You just jump in. Don't don't uh, just ask the questions. Whatever questions you want to ask. So okay. when we, when we last left our hero, uh, Bruce, you were about we were talking about the protothrall, which of course to us an hour has passed. To everybody that's listening, only a bit of elevator music and a few seconds have passed. Yes. So go ahead and ask your question again. Uh, my question was: you were talking about how the protothrall. Uh, you seem to it to you it acts like the real thing, and I just wanted to kind of expand on that. How it seems to. Uh, being a locomotive engineer, how the proto throttle really fits into giving you uh, the feeling that you're actually operating a locomotive. Now, before we do the answer that question, should we go into some more background about exactly what Tim's uh, line of work is, or should we answer that question first? Well, I thought we mentioned it before about an hour and a half ago, didn't we? <laughs> well, we, we only had been on for 10 minutes, so we briefly touched on Well, that's on true. It. We hadn't been on that long. We, we hadn't really done the whole background thing about the tree trains under the tree and all. Okay. So, uh, to, to recap, 
<laughs> yeah. So what do you? Where do you, where do you want me to start with a train under the tree, or do you want well, to start with a proto throttle? Uh, well, let's <laughs> let's tell everybody tell everybody what. Let's we'll, we'll do it this way, Ralph. Uh, we're gonna do it. We're gonna talk. Uh, go out of uh, out of sequence. Do you think that's okay? That's fine by me. All right. So let's do it this way. Let's give everybody a very uh, detailed account of what it is you do for a living. Well, um, I'm a locomotive engineer for Norfolk Southern. I, uh, I've been working with Norfolk Southern since July of 1996, hired out as a conductor. By 2000, I was promoted to an engineer. Uh, a couple of years later, I took an office job as a supervisor um, for seven years working in rail car management and distribution. And then I came back to running a train about 2012 and, and been an engineer ever since. Wow. Um, now I've been, I'm right now I'm number 11 on the engineer seniority roster on my district over probably about 75 engineers. So that allows me a little flexibility and scheduling wise. I can, I have more options when it comes to picking particular runs or jobs to work. So I like to, I prefer the uh, local work where I can uh, work during the daylight hours and be off on Saturday and Sunday versus mainline work, which I've done for many years where you're out of town every other day and, and that's mostly working, mostly nights and weekends. So, so uh, when yeah, you're I, based on I, your seniority, did the seven years in the office count towards seniority? My seniority kept going, yes. I, I was, while I was an officer, uh, my seniority uh, yeah, it kept moving forward. And I could have chose to stay as an officer. I, while I was downtown, I, I went back and finished uh, a couple of college degrees in business management, and that gave me an opportunity to do that. And uh, with the company's help, they helped pay for a lot of my schooling. And, uh, but, you know, the engineer job that's that's always been what i've been passionate about um i enjoy i enjoy that type of work plus the pay was better than what i was making in the office so so it's a uh, it's it's been a good career it's uh, i've enjoyed it uh you know like a lot of you know kids growing up uh, trains i was always fascinated with trains uh when I was real young, of course, I was fascinated with any kind of machines. A lot of people, you know, not only trains, construction, equipment, airplanes, ships, trucks, cars, you name it. I, I was all into that stuff. But um, but when I was fairly young, uh, the trains really captivated me and I became a rail fan at an early age. And um, one one day, uh, a gentleman that went to our church was a conductor for uh, Southern and then later Norfolk Southern. He knew how much I loved the trains, and so he took me uh, on his off day. He took me to where a local was working, and they let me get up in the cab, ride the locomotive. The engineer asked me if I wanted to run the locomotive for a little ways, and I did. And it was then I said, you know what? I'm going to do this when I grow up one day. And that was probably when I was around 12 years old. And opportunities just, you know, presented itself, and I worked my way, eventually uh, ended up with a getting hired out it took me a while but uh after a lot of hiring sessions but i finally got made it through so um okay so there's some interesting questions to ask so bruce do you remember what your question was again oh yeah operating the proto throttle uh go ahead bruce ask your question for the third time for, for the, the third, third time. time on this show the third tonight, and hopefully last, last time. time on this show tonight <laughs> bruce wilson <laughs> bruce wilson ask your question Hi. Is it true that dogs are better than cats? Oh, sorry. No. Oh, sorry. That's the wrong show. I Proto throttle. Why yeah. do you think it kind of gives you the real feel of operating a unit? What well, What is it about it? Well, first, the, um, I had to tweak mine you, um, because I, I wanted mine to really simulate what a, the uh, what I do in the cab of the engine. And so there's some things... I had I actually cut out his uh, the emergency brake feature, for instance. If you uh, put the brake on all the way, uh, way they have it in the default setting, it puts it your train into emergency. Well, the way I look at the proto throttle, 
um, the emergency feature on a real locomotive is associated with an automatic train brake. And that brake that's on the proto throttle mimics more of the independent brake, which actually just controls the brakes on the locomotive and not the train cars. And so on the independent brake, um, it works very similar to the brake on the proto throttle. And you can, you can actually cut that default setting out and apply it all the way, just like I would the real um, brake on a real locomotive. And so when I mentioned that the proto throttle is more better suited for yard type work, often when I'm switching cars around in the yard, I don't even touch the automatic train brake because sometimes the cars don't even have air brakes on them. They're, they, they're just bled off so that conductors can kick the cars around and they'll roll freely into a track. And the only thing, the only method of stopping is just with the engine brakes. And so you can really get close to uh, how a real locomotive operates when you have it set up in this fashion. And uh, if you tweak your decoders to where your decoders act a lot like a real locomotive by uh, uh, bumping up that acceleration, you know, number and also maxing out that deceleration number and you can adjust the each notch setting on the proto throttle where you have that each notch simulates an increase in the rpm levels of the the engine wow you can really pull it off and and i played around with mine where i have my locomotives operate on my layout the same way a real sd40-2 or a real gp40-2 uh, would do on the prototype and so man when you do something like that it it really changes the feel um and yeah. the experience you get because um, i can see i can today for instance when i was at work i was using two sd40-2s at work and, and i can look and see exactly what i'm doing in the uh, real locomotive when i come out on the throttle and i say you know what i did the same thing on my proto throttle at home and the, and the engines on my models do the exact same thing <laughs> and so and so when you when you get home and you're in your layout and you are able to do that and you can think back, hey, I just did that earlier today on the real thing. Wow. You're like, man, I got this thing set up right. And it's a great feeling um, knowing that you have your models tuned up just like a real thing. That is. Hmm. Uh, have you thought of doing a video an, an instructional video about that? Um, yeah, that's uh, some people might know me from my Seaboard Central youtube uh, channel or my seaboard central facebook page and uh i'm going to eventually do some how-to videos and and i'm going to do a lot of operational vi videos and that's one of the things i'll probably touch on i've shown some of the proto throttle some videos of me operating the proto throttle but getting into the more detail of of actually doing it and operating it the uh, the same um, as i would in real life yeah, that's something. Okay, with all that said, and you, you're obviously running DCC or you wouldn't have the proto throttle, what type of decoders are you using? Are you using the ESU ones with the uh, uh, full throttle feature? Yes. Yeah, and, and with, with the proto throttle, I will tell you it's best to stick with one brand of decoder. Mm -hmm. If you have, um, it, well, let me back up a little bit. If you only have one locomotive or you only run one locomotive at a time, a single unit, it doesn't matter. But if you run a multiple unit consist, say a locomotive right. with two or more engines, you want to be able to have the decoders because the full throttle features on the ESU decoders aren't the same as what a Tsunami 2 or, or a TCS decoder will do. And so you don't want to mix brands. It's always, you know, stick to one brand. So I've, I, I like, I personally prefer the ESU decoders because of that full throttle and drive hold feature mm -hmm. where I can simulate the, um, the mass of the train, uh, starting the train up, um, and with Rev that, the motor without moving the loco. Well, you know, for instance, let's just say you're light engines, you run into a cut of cars, you, you couple up to the cars and now you've got a, a long string of cars and you want to simulate that tonnage that you're about to start. And so you can you can uh, put the proto throttle in notch one to stretch the slack out, and then with that big auxiliary button, which I have mapped to the drive hold feature on my ESU decoders, I can depress that 
that uh, drive hole button and then just keep notching out and you can hear the engines revving up like they're straining to get that track of cars moving and just by uh, letting the uh, drive hole go for just a second and then re-engaging it it's going to try to catch up to whatever speed step you're you're at and but you can fool it by keep locking it out with that drive hole and you're the whole time you're simulating trying to get that train started and once you do get it started if you have your deceleration value max completely out then when you notch off all the way to idle the thing will coast for a long ways and then you know you can gradually apply that brake and bring the train to a stop and that's that's just like we do what we do on the real thing because whenever i'm switching cars out in the yard or, or switching an industry or whatever my main objective is to get things rolling first and then most of the time i can you're we're talking about low speed switching and you're either going to a coupling or whatever then i can just put the the locomotives into idle and let it coast and then just feather that engine brake until i bring it to where the conductor needs me to bring it to if i need to add a little throttle i'll add a little throttle and if i don't sometimes i can do it just right where i can make a decent coupling without knocking me out of the seat <laughs> Now, you mentioned uh, you were setting up your units to uh, uh, replicate things. So, obviously, each one of your locomotives you set up so that it's working right. So, when you consist them together, it's, you know, everything's in sync, as it were. Yeah, well, it, this, is, this is where a lot of modelers don't realize real locomotives are not speed matched. <laughs> Maybe on the top end they are, but definitely not on the low end. And the different... Locomotives have different characteristics, and, and so I have my favorites that I like to operate, and I have some that I don't care about operating. Matter of fact, I've banned certain locomotives from my model railroad because I just distaste them in real life. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, you have some engines that are super slow to get moving. You know, you could just look at your watch and you could just watch the seconds roll around before they'll actually even start rolling. And you have others that are pretty have pretty decent startups and are quick um, and you learn to appreciate that more and so and so I, I do I, I, I'll give you a good example for instance I'll set the CV3 which is the acceleration value on my locomotives to around 175 and that tends to give it sounds like a lot doesn't it compared yeah, to what does. most people have but most locomotives when you crack that throttle they they don't move immediately. Um, now, I've heard stories. I've never operated some of the Alco RS3s, but I've heard stories about how fast they would they would actually start moving. And I have operated some true GP38s, not the GP38-2s, but the GP38s and the GP38ACs. And they are very quick um, once you crack that throttle open. They want to move. Um, but the uh, most locomotives, there's a, at least about a two or three second delay before they'll even turn a wheel once you crack that throttle open you can hear them start revving up but they don't and you take a, a conrail dash eight and you can count five or six seconds before that thing will even start moving general electric the old ge the dash sevens the u-boats wow they are slow you they're some of the slowest engines ever produced as far as uh, getting something started but I, for me, I like SD forty dash twos, the GP forty dash twos, because they they're good. They're great engines to switch with, and uh, they they move pretty good when you want to move them. I'm surprised you're using an SD forty for switching. I thought they were a mainline engine. At one time they were. Uh, and they've okay. been. They've been uh, now. They're considered a medium horsepower engine. Uh, the SD forty dash two is probably the best all-purpose locomotive that's ever been created because uh, they can do anything but they really shine when it comes to switching and and industry work uh, they're better than anything I've I've run I mean I've run the, the GP 38s but they don't have the same power as a, a good pair of SD 40 2s because you can do a lot of things with two SD 40 2s that you can't just do with other locomotives the uh, big the big what we call road hogs the big uh, the new modern diesel locomotives, the 4,000 horsepower and 4,500 horsepower locomotives, they've all bumped the uh, the SD40s out of mainline service now. You know, the SD40s are 40, going on close to 50 years old now. 
<laughs> what horsepower do they have? With the yes, SC40s, the, 3,000. Okay. So they're, they're considered a medium horsepower engine. All right. So, uh, so how did you get started in this hobby? Are you the same as everybody else with the tree, the trains yeah, under the tree? No, no. Um, um, I'm an Air Force brat. My dad uh, was an officer in the military, and we were stationed down in Warner Robins, Georgia, at the time. And my dad's hobby at that time was ham radio. And I remember him uh, paying a visit to some guy about a ham radio, and I tagged along. I was probably six years old, I think. And uh, so the guy had a kid and had a lot of toys in his room. And while the, my dad was talking to the to the guy, I went in the little boy's room. And of all the toys he had in his floor, and it seemed I can remember back that boy's floor was cluttered with all kind of toys. There was a train set just laying in the floor. And I remember it was a train set that had a, um, a wrecking crane on it. And I was fascinated by that thing. And so I said, you know, for my seventh birthday, I said, I want a train set. I, I really want a train set. So the first train set my dad bought me at the time, that would be back in 1977, uh, was a Tyco Chattanooga Choo Choo train set, <laughs> 280 or 282 or something like that. And, uh, and But it did have the wrecking crane on it, the, what we call a derrick um, with a boom car and everything and, and a figure eight track. And, and I was just... It just went from there, and I, I can remember um, about 10 years old, maybe 10 or 11 years old, visiting the Chattanooga Choo Choo, and they had a large model railroad club that was up in one of the freight freight houses um, at that hotel. And I remember the guy, you know, just, just seeing all those model trains going there, I was just completely blown away. And the guy said, get an Atlas engine. And... Yes, this was probably been 1980, 82, somewhere in there. And so Daddy found a hobby shop in Marietta, Georgia. We went there, and my first real scale locomotive was an Atlas FP7. <laughs> and, uh -huh. I can, and I can still, re I still have that engine. I, and actually, I want to, uh, I want to refurbish it and, uh, and uh, feature it on my layout one day, put a decoder in it. Um, and because that was the first real model railroad engine I ever got way back then. And I've been a model railroader ever since. I've never, I'm not one of those guys, you know, left the hobby and then came back, found it later when you got into your thirties, your forties, I've stuck with it through all these years. And, and, uh, and it's, it's been real, it's been real enjoyable to me. I've, I bought a lot of things over the years and sold a lot of things <laughs> and, uh, and learned so much from uh, so many different modelers uh, my mom my mom bought me a subscription to model railroader magazine probably when i was 11 or 12 years old and every christmas she renews that that uh subscription for me and right to this day to this day oh that's cool yeah and so and so you know i you know, I've, I've got the, the reason why I chose the Seaboard Central, which is a freelance railroad, is because I loved um, Alan McClellan's Virginia and Ohio. I remember seeing it in an right. you know, old book uh, and being blown away by the picture in Bruce Chubb's Sunset Valley. And then uh, later, Tony Custer's uh, Allegheny Midland. I remember that layout. And, and, but it was the Eric Bruman's Utah Belt. Yeah. That Utah belt layout, wow! Uh, I was just, to me, that was a real railroad. You, you know, you. I just figured the Utah belt really existed, and uh, it was just so believable. And uh, so, around when I was twenty years old, I mean, nineteen ninety, that's when I came up with the idea of the Seaboard Central, and it was supposed to be something along the same lines as the as the Utah belt. And I've kept that uh, going ever since, and and. That's just my, what if I was the president of my own railroad? How would I run it? <laughs> right, exactly. And so, okay, so you never took time off from the hobby. Right. And where do you where do you live now? I live in a small town called Hiram, Georgia, at least for the next couple of years until my youngest uh, daughter uh, graduates from high school. Then my wife and I are both going to move up farther north, closer to my friend Tom Klamoski's uh, place not that far north but uh, on the way uh, in northern georgia because i actually stand for every single local in gainesville georgia which is a 
is in the middle of my district between uh, Atlanta and Greenville, South Carolina. And um, all right, hang on there. You lost me. So you stand for every district in Gainesville. Is that what you said? My my seniority district runs between Atlanta, Georgia and Greenville, South Carolina. OK. And the NS line that runs between there. And right now we're a local out of Shambly. Uh, we have about 10 road switchers based out of Shambly. Shambly is a suburb just north of Metro Atlanta, or just north of Atlanta. It's in Metro Atlanta encompasses a large area. Okay. And to battle the traffic every day, um, depending on what time you have to be at work, sometimes it's hour and 45 minutes, you know, one way. Right. And, And it's just rush hour, interstate traffic, and it's just... I don't, I don't want to deal with it anymore and, you know, move to a smaller town, uh, you know, where life's a lot slower and I can take country roads to, to get to a, another outline point. Yeah. Yeah. Where, and, um, so, like it's, said, so the, the line, the district your your uh, uh, seniority is in runs from Atlanta, Atlanta all the way to Greenville, South Carolina. Right. And so we have, um, three outline points between those uh, that where we have locals are road switchers stationed. Um, and uh, so actually we have four and, uh, and because of, we still have the guys that's retires every year. So it's just a matter of time. I'm going to be in the top five and, and that allows me to, you know, a lot more options where I want to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And pretty much do whatever you want. So let's go back to that part where you worked in the office Mm-hmm. And, and then decided to go back out onto the road. Like what, what was the sequence of events there? You were just kind of looking out the window, wishing you were <laughs> back out onto the road kind of thing or. No, no, I'm just tired of the office politics, I guess. Uh, you know, that, uh, you, you, you try to do, do everything you can. And, and it's just tired of playing politics, uh, with what, you know, when you're trying to get a promotion or whatever. And, and I said, you know, I didn't have to deal with that. Uh, as a locomotive engineer, you just came in and you did your job and did yeah. it safely, and you went back home. And you wasn't it, you wasn't part of the rat race. You wasn't you wasn't trying to elbow your way to the top, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And and it just life was better. And I and I just saw how much, uh, you know, at the time my my children were were about to start college. And I said, you know what, I, I got to think about that, too. Uh, uh, you know, it'd be one thing if I was if I was on up the ladder, you know, making making really good money. That wouldn't be an issue. But uh, as a, someone in middle management or, or lower management, just it. And I was looking what I could be making as a locomotive engineer. You know, it's, I, said, I, I need to do that. I need to think about just going back and to uh, exercise and- my craft. And and you, it's something you wanted to do anyway, so it really wasn't a hard decision to make, probably, eh? Oh no, no, I, you know, that's something you know. You it, years ago, I remember a guy that, uh, and I'd always took that advice. Um, you know, when you settle on a career, find something that you love doing, and you'll feel like you never go to work. You know, it, once you figure that out, what what it is that your drives you, your passion, what you're passionate about, and I was passionate about trains you know being around trains and and uh once i started you know at 19 i couldn't get hired on with the either csx or norfolk southern so the first job out of high school i had was operating a steam locomotive at six flags over georgia the little oil oil burning 440 narrow gauge locomotive you know the one that johnny cash featured in his uh i don't know tv show he did one time he the two little engines there uh, that were supposed to be the from the great locomotive chase during the civil war era. Right. And so there, I, you know, it allowed me to meet some retired guys that had retired from uh, the railroad and I'd sit and listen to their stories and everything. And they romanticized about how it was working, working for the Southern and, and, um, and uh, then after that, I, I left and worked for a short line railroad for a, uh, for a few months. Then I went back to college and and uh, eventually got hired and back on with the uh, or hired at Norfolk Southern when that opening came up. So how how old were you when you got on with Norfolk Southern? Twenty six, and I'm forty nine now. All right. So uh, so it it yeah it's a 
I won't say it's been easy. Uh, definitely, it's uh, you know I'm on my second marriage. Right? Are you still there? Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, I can hear him. Oh, okay, I turned him off. <laughs> uh, I'm here. I was trying to turn Ralph off, and I turned him off. Ralph, you were making. Were you were you working on something there? No. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, when you came back into the room, something happened. Something went goofy there. So now where was it? Oh yeah, you're on your second marriage and you're happy and all that stuff. Right. right. Yeah, my new my new wife. She much prefers me being home every night versus uh, over the road and spending the night in the hotel in a in Greenville. <laughs> 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 the main line has its perks. That, you know, it uh, it's it's uh, it give you an adrenaline rush running down the tracks at sixty miles an hour. You know, it, especially if you got some good running locomotives. I can remember back in the day when we had the GP60s on the main line. Right. And the GP60s are the closest thing, uh, diesel-wise, that's ever been created to a Corvette. Really? If you wanted to compare, yeah, yeah. That, uh, if, nice. Yeah, they, they were built for speed. Because you're talking about high horsepower on four axles. And a GP60 is... It's not the greatest engines to work industries with because they're like a thoroughbred horse. They want to move. And so when you're trying to spot a tank car underneath a, a, a unloading platform and you, uh, you're, you're pushing, holding it back, you know, with the, with the brakes, you got one hand on your brake and the other hand on the throttle. Yeah. And you're, and the, the thing is just wanting to leap forward with you because it's just so much power. The, the uh, gear ratio on them are higher than say a GP 38 dash two. And um, they want to they want to take off and run. <laughs> They're built to run. They're not built for the slow stuff. It kind of reminds me of wonder what it was like when they took the um, the PS fours out of uh, mainline service. The old Southern what four eight twos or four six twos yeah. or whatever it was, and put them in maintenance away service. You know that's not what those engines were made for. Those made were made for hauling passenger trains. And now you're you're wanting to use them in the maintenance way department <laughs> yeah uh bruce see if i'm right on this one or not okay uh tim sounds like a real honest to goodness through and through railroader i concur like i mean just the way you talk about the locomotives and everything just sounds very cool hey ralph there's something going maybe leave and come back and get your yours is acting kind of weird now he he sounds he sounds like a guy that really enjoys his job. Well, no, no kidding. And now he's relating his model railroading to his job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the I, thing I, when I worked in the office, that did give me a lot of opportunity to learn about uh, car movements because I worked in uh, rail car distribution. So, um, <laughs> matter of fact, um, I took a lot of that information that I was getting from the office and I was using it on my layout because, uh, you were learning all about the different rail car types, and um, and I was able to uh, see exactly whose cars that people were manufacturing at the time actually existed, were actually running out there on the track. So I was making a database up of, uh, okay, I need to go out and buy this Atlas tank car because this Atlas tank car has actually exists out on the railroad. That our, this Walther's you know, center beam flat car is actually rolling around out there. And, uh, and so I was able to get a lot of information about that. And then, and then especially if you were trying to develop operating, uh, you know, for operations, where, where are these cars originating from? Where are they going to? And you could, you could develop an operating plan based off of that stuff. So that, that was really helpful. And I learned a lot of stuff that way. I'm glad I, I'm glad I did do that. Um, just for that reason. But you must've been one of the few guys in the office qualified as a locomotive engineer though, weren't you? Yes, I was. Uh, there, m most of the people in the department I was working in came out of the clerical ranks, and so it was unusual for somebody to come out of the transportation side to go to that department. Because um, when I first went down there, I was in the National Customer Service Center in the chemical and paper group, dealing with shippers that ship chemical products and paper products, and then I got asked to go to, uh, promoted to go into car distribution. I started distributing box cars went over to the hopper group and ended up at my last thing before I came back to the field was distributing all the covered coil cars. 
So I managed all the Norfolk Southern covered coil cars in the entire fleet. So before we get beyond that, I know a lot of people haven't heard anybody talk about that. Like, what does that mean? Just being the, the guy that distributes the cars, the distribution. Okay, uh, rail car distribution. Uh, let's just say um, you uh, you have our customers. They go on Norfolk Southern's website. They can log on, and they want to place a car order to order um, X amount of cars this week to load out. Whatever car type, you know, we'd, we'd have them a, a profile set up. If they loaded box cars, at, at one time I distributed 60-foot box cars that hauled paper. So any customer that requested a high cube or a low cube or a double door, single door, plug door, sliding door, whatever, they wanted to load that particular car type, 70 ton, 100 ton, you name it. They could, they could order that particular car, and it was my job to get it there in time for them to load that, get that load out. Um, with the covered coils, you're talking about gigantic steel mills. Um, and that would U.S. Steel it has a number of locations, AK Steel. They would order uh, one out of Irvine, Pennsylvania, would load out 200 a week. You know, you, you, you're talking about a lot of cars that needed to go through Conway Yard uh, to get distributed over to the Union Railroad. And that was that was a challenge because you're having to find all these cars, these empties coming available and route them, get them routed that way. Because if they didn't get enough real cars, you know, we could lose business to CSX or you could lose business to trucks. That, that was that was the challenge, getting the getting the cars available to be loaded. And so so when you did that, like you had to like how how does that work? How does distribution work? Because I know a lot of people don't know. What, so, like, what on you're looking? You have a list, or you're looking on the computer, and well, the, what what happens is they the the railroad is uh, divided up into distribution areas, and so what you do is the computer finds the cars. You just set the computer up uh, to locate when once a one customer unloads a car, or, or once a car comes online through an interchange point or whatever, you can you can set up. Uh, so many cars coming out originating that from that distribution area to start filling out orders and so what you want to try to do is cut the empty miles down that's the goal is you don't want your empty miles to exceed your loaded miles so you try to the goal is to try to find the closest empty this that you can use um, to fill that load and that and these days now these days we have so many specialized cars you know back in the probably the the transition era you know, you had a lot of general purpose cars so that they were a little more free to use uh, different cars. Now, there's so many specialized cars, you they can only be loaded with one particular product, and that's it. And so you um, you don't have a lot of general purpose cars anymore. And so that, that car just, a lot of them go back and forth. And um, model railroad-wise, it's instead of having that four-cycle way, Bill, you just have a two-cycle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you can you can you can send that load to di different customers to unload, but it's always going to come back to that same spot to be loaded again. And you have different pools. The uh, cars are set up: uh, shipper assigned pools, uh, customer assigned pools. Uh, you have uh, open pools, or, or like the trailer train type pools, the national pools um, and, that you can draw from. It's comp kind of complicated, but uh, once you figure it out, it's it's not too bad. And this is all done on computer somehow. You're you're made aware of what cars are empty and where they are, and mm -hmm. yeah, you you pretty much keep track of it. When uh, during the recession, I was down there during the recession, and we ended up putting. I see Norfolk Southern at the time had ninety owned ninety nine thousand rail cars, and we probably had close to two thirds of them in storage. Wow! Wow! Yep. Holy mackerel. So you're only, Norfolk Southern is only using like a third of the cars during the recession. Well, when, when a recession hits like that. And so uh, now, of course, now the latest trend with these railroads is this uh, PSR, which is, don't, don't get me started on it. But the goal, the goal, is, uh, the goal is to actually uh, lower the, the fleet number to get rid of a lot of you know, cars that haven't moved. One reason why you don't see new box cars being produced today is the average number of trip a box car makes per year really hasn't changed since 1950. Really? 
Yeah, you might get two loads a year out of a box car. And you're talking about major investment to, in, to buy a brand new T-Box or a new F-Box 100 ton high cube car. You know, you, that's a lot of money to invest in something that's probably only going to make one or two trips the entire year. Now, is that just like general purpose? Because I, I know I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, and there's a lot of cars were assigned back to auto plants. Uh, no, you know, auto when parts when when, when empty return to Essex Terminal Railway. Yeah, you're, no, you're talking about you're, yeah, auto parts cars are a little different than, than they yeah. are assigned to a specific plant because they have uh, racks. Uh, right, a lot okay. of them have racks that have that are hold those those particular parts. So you get a lot more turns out of those cars. Okay. So they're yeah. just going back and forth. And uh, but a, a car, say for instance, a, a T box car that comes out of California hauling carnation milk for and cans that for some plant in Nestle in Georgia. You know, once that car goes empty, um, it it may go to a clean out track or it may it may uh, go to get its next load. Whatever whatever that car distributor needs. If that car distributor needs that thing to pick up a load of plywood or a load of uh, paper or whatever, it's going to, since it's a, you know, it's more of a free runner type car with the participating railroads. You have to have a, you have to be a participating railroad in order to use it, but that'd be more of considered a general purpose type car. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember back, uh, I'll be in what the seventies, where there's uh, supposedly the boxcar shortage. That's when uh, Railbox came out, you know, next load, any load type thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, to hear you saying it sounds like there's been a uh, you know significant surplus of uh, boxcars for a number of years. Well, you're saying on right now there, there, there's yeah, there's a lot of there's more than they need, and they'll be cutting up a lot of the older seventy ton, fifty foot cars. Um, you the R boxes and the A boxes, you rarely see an A box anymore. Um, but most of the customers these days, they want a hundred ton car. Uh, they're, you know, they want to be able to fit as much as they can in one car. So now when you say two trips, like would that be, would that maybe be a short trip and a long trip or is it so it really depends? Like, I mean, it's kind of interesting to hear you say a car, a box car only really make two trips, uh, two loaded trips a year. And, well, it's just it's just the law of averages. When you if you have more cars than you need for that, sure. Because, you, well, once the con, the double stack container boom hit, and you have these fifty three foot domestic containers, they stole a lot of that box car business, and so now you have a surplus number of cars, and so the car gets unloaded, and it, if it doesn't have a place to go to, it's just gonna it's gonna go into storage until it's needed and so it may sit for a while before it actually gets a reload now we the route i work we have a customer that receives box cars and if they uh if it's a car that they can reload so they get in rolls of paper right and they create and they create a, a byproduct would be a scrap paper that from the whatever they're making i'm, I'm not sure i they may, be, may make cardboard boxes i don't know maybe they get right. pulp and uh, they have scrap, and if it's an R box that they can reload, they'll keep that car and reload it out with bales of scrap. So you'll see a load go in and a load come out. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah, okay. So now, uh, but, or a minute ago, you said, don't get me started on PSR, is that what you said? Precision Scheduled Railroading. Yeah, let's get you started on that. <laughs> <laughs> For is, that like, is that like just in time? No, 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 no. <laughs> No, it's it's more of an efficiency thing. Uh, let's see what we can squeeze the assets. It's all about squeezing the assets, and um, and there is one good thing about it that I actually like that actually would help help model railroaders out it, at least on Norfolk Southern. I'm not sure about CSX or Canadian National or Canadian Pacific, but on Norfolk Southern we have what we call static tracks. And uh, first of all, I guess let me. I used to tell customers when I worked in customer service how the railroad operates. If you take just general freight service, your your general mixed freight trains, they they operate more like um, the U.S. U.S. Postal Service or maybe UPS, in that you have classification yards, which are like giant distribution centers, distribution facilities, and then you have local serving yards, which are like your local post office, and so that. Uh, 
you'll see trains go back and forth, uh, go between large classification yards, but then you'll have, a, they'll break it on down and there'll be a train that will have to stop and make set offs and pickups at a local serving yard that exists between the two classification yards. So, for instance, we have Brosnan Yard down in Macon, Georgia, that originates train 118 that goes to Linwood, North Carolina. 118 comes and has a block of cars for our yard at Shambly. He sets the block of cars off in, in one track and he picks up any cars that need to go to Linwood out of another track, goes back to the main line and, and takes off. And so with this PSR, what they came out with was static yard tracks. And what they mean by that is they started designating tracks for certain things. And so before, it's just wherever we could put them. Sometimes we'd have some kind of rhyme or reason why we would designate tracks for for certain things. Right. But now they actually put it in. They put it in stone. For instance, if they got a track that's got cars destined for making, that track is the same track all the time. And what they did is they did a study. They said, okay, we're going to run that train seven days a week. That's going to stop and pick those cars up. What's the average number of cars on any day? How many? makings would you have and they say okay we have 30 makings uh, at the most and i said okay let's find a track that'll hold 30 at least 30 cars and they designated that track and so no matter what conductor it is if he's working a local if he's working a mainline he knows that or she knows that 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 track is designated as the making track so when you come in with your cars off of a local run, you know, if you have any Macon's, you put them in that track. If you have any Birmingham's, you put in that track and, and other different, whatever different blocks. And, uh, and the same thing goes with the inbound. We have an inbound track. We actually have two inbound tracks where trains that come in and set off inbound cuts that go to local area customers. Once those cars get set off, then a, a yard job or a local crew will take those cars and they'll start classifying them. And so we'll have tracks designated, say, for uh, different uh, train jobs. For instance, mine, that there's a track of cars where all of the cars that my local needs. So right. where our cars are always going to be. So it makes it, it makes it a lot easier. Um, if you know, you could do the same thing on your lap. So I did that on my Seaboard Central. I started designating. I, I, that's the part I love the most about um, operations is just doing little yard work. And um, so I can take a train, come in, make a set off, and I can separate the cars and classify them into the tracks that they need to go to. And I can have them pick up from another track. And it's just like that we do actually in real life. So um, why do people love trains? You're a perfect guy to ask this question too, because you're you 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 worked in the office. I mean, you worked you got on with uh, with Norfolk Southern. How, how old did you say you were when you got on? I was 26. Right, and so you got on when you were 26 after several tries, by the sounds of it, at least mm -hmm. a couple, three tries. You got on with the railroad. You were a conductor, and you made a you got it on to being an engineer, and then you thought. Okay, like normal, like a regular person, you thought, okay, uh, to advance my career, I'm going to move into the office because probably you didn't have the best uh, choice of trains when you were first an engineer. So, no, and that, that that was about the time when my third child was born. And um, it was rough uh, being on the engineer's extra board. <laughs> at least it was, it was, you know, it was rough for my family at the time. And so I... Um, uh, so I thought, well, it would be a lot easier if I went to the office and had a had a seven to four job with the weekends off. And so I did that for a while. And um, it so, was a good experience. But, yeah, why do you, what, your, your question, what is it about trains that I actually have a little nephew that's uh, about seven, seven years old now, I think. And he's fascinated by trains where his older brothers, yeah, he, he likes them, but he's not like the his, his younger brother. Right. Which. It's like the train bug has bit him, and um, and I don't know. It, it just bites some people, you know. It, the the um, I don't know this if it's the sense of uh, the mass, uh, just something this large, you know, moving and uh, and there's something romantic about the rails as they, you know, there's so many times you see wherever you go for a train watching spot, often the you know the rails curve off into. A, into a cut of woods and 
there's something romantic about two rails and these massive machines come down the come down the way on these two rails and then you know well, people think people think about that and they they what i see from from my office window uh is i see a lot of people that look at it uh look at trains as is like something that's just unreal for them uh, you know it's just something it is something that's they think it's there's something they don't see every day and and so but the scary part is is how people will uh think oh it's pretty cool let's go stand in front in front of a train in the tracks and make a selfie or you know right and, and you see that and you're like people come on this is yeah you're you're playing you're, yeah you're playing with fire here yeah and, well, uh, you're not going to stop it so no and and so you have your moments but there's good moments too when you when you go through um a little small town there's one we go through um and Norcross, Georgia has a little park and there's always families with small children and every one of them, they all line the fence and they're all waving at you when you, are you, when are, you come through. And Are you and, a wa uh, Are you a waver? Oh, yeah. I, sometimes I put on a show. You, you remember the, uh, what was it, the, uh, the Burma Shave? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I'll do that for them. <laughs> well, explain to people what you're talking about because not everybody will know. So you do that with the horn? Oh yeah! Yeah, oh, cool. Especially if I got a good horn, it'll do it. Oh, that's cool. That's a cool thing to do. I mean, it's cool that that you enjoy it. It's fun to talk to you because you you enjoy it so much. So let's talk. Yeah. We'll kind yeah, of... it's, it's like it's like my coaster tag says: your job, if you're on that unit, is somebody waves, you wave back. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, we got a. I don't. You've listened to some of the podcasts, I'm assuming, eh, Tim? Yes. I, oh, yeah. They're good. Because, like, Lionel, I have to drive an hour and a half to get home. What's the <laughs> best way to. I just turn the thing on and listen to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great because I just turn it on and listen to the interviews and I enjoy it. Actually, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I do that. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. You can lie too and tell us you enjoy it. You, you know. no, no, yeah, no, either no, way, we're happy. Yeah, either no, way, just so long as you're talking. No, it, it's interesting. It's better than listening to some of the other stuff that's on the radio. So now, do you belong to Patreon? Or are you listening to those ones too? No, no. Okay, well, now you're going to have to cough up five bucks a month. So you got all those ones to listen to as well. <laughs> um, uh, and so, there is a bunch. And there is a bunch. Yeah, there's a, a lot. Um, uh, which ones are your favorites, Ralph? The ones with me on them or the ones with you on them? Oh, uh, well, you first. Oh, okay, attaboy. Uh, you, you know what? Oh, I mean, you tell me first. <laughs> oh, okay. My favorite are the ones with you on them. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so, all right, let's hear something about, I want to hear, uh, we're going to cut this a little bit shorter because are you up for doing the Kelly questions? Sure. Okay, because we all uh, got a late start here, and I know Bruce, the mailboy, he has a big uh, basket of emails he has to go through before he goes to bed. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about your actual layout. You call it the Seaboard Central. Now, uh, how many, uh, is this like your third layout, your fourth layout, your first layout? Oh, wow. I don't know what version this is, and it's definitely not going to be the last. Um like I said, we're going to be moving in, in 2021. So um, it's a sectional layout. Uh, right now it's around the walls in a, an approximately 12 by 23 foot room. Um, I'm going to be doing a center peninsula um, soon, but I'm going to make those peninsulas more like Joe Fugate's Toma design where it's uh, those modules will be easily transported to the new new place and they'll be the very beginning of a new layout right? okay um yeah it, it, it i don't know what version this is um there's a at first i wanted to create a double deck layout and then as things progressed i realized you know what i, I really don't want to do that anymore and so the layout i have now is actually too low it's 40 inches off the floor and i tell anybody it, unless they're planning on building a double deck layout uh don't go lower than 48. Right. Um, and uh, so the next layout will definitely be a minimum of 48, between 48 and 54 inches off the floor. And um, and and also, back to the proto throttle, it has completely 
rechanged my layout design process. Really? Yes, completely rechanged it. Um, well, one thing I will I will tell you, I'm one of those guys that I appreciate uh, running as realistic as I can. So that doesn't mean I'm up for somebody running like, say, somebody that owns a template three rail, you know, running max <laughs> speed. Right. And, right. and I know, you know, with our tight radius curves, it just looks odd to me if I see a train going faster than it should be around that curve. Mm -hmm. um, a good example. Uh, well, in real life, we sometimes I'll go to a yard in uh, downtown Atlanta that has a Y, and that Y has a 21 degree curve, and that's the tightest you can put a six axle locomotive around without derailing. Is a 21 degree curve any tighter than 21 degrees, and you you risk blowing the thing off the rail. 21 degrees in HO scale is about 37 inches. So that's a 37 wow. inch radius curve. Obviously, my layout it, it doesn't have 37 inch radius curves. I've got some where it's 24 inch, but I know that's the tightest I want to go. Right. I don't want to, when I run locomotives around that, that 21 degree curve Y, I can't exceed 10 miles an hour. That's the fastest I can take those locomotives around that Y. Uh, so why would I want to run my HO scale models around something that would be a lot tighter than what the real life at a, at a higher speed? It just looks out of out of place to me. It doesn't sure. look. Sure. Yeah, yeah. When you slow it down going through those curves, you can pull it off to make it look more realistic because you're we have curve restrictions um, on the main line. Um for instance, uh, Seneca, South Carolina has a, f a 40 mile an hour speed restricted curve through the town. You know the engine that's up in the Smithsonian, the 1401, uh -huh. Southern Railway steam engine that they've got in the Smithsonian. I knew a guy uh, I met at Six Flags. I didn't know it or believe him until later. I found out he was telling the truth. His nickname was Buttermilk Wade. He was a locomotive engineer for Southern. And he told me one day while we were sitting there on break, that he had actually ran the 1401 back to Atlanta from Greenville. They were running late, and he came through Seneca. And, and mind you, at that time, that steam engine didn't have a radio on the locomotive. That was way back, right? You know, late 40s, I guess. Behind it was an E unit, and a road foreman didn't want to get all dirty right in that coal-fired steam engine, so he ran back there in that E E E unit. Well, they get to Atlanta that at the time, which is now Peachtree Station, was just a suburban stop. And so they got there, and the road foreman come stomping up there to the front of the engine and said, Buttermilk, do you know how fast you took those curves through Seneca, South Carolina? He said, because the, the E unit had a speedometer. He said, well, I know I wasn't letting the grass grow between the rails. <laughs> he said, <laughs> and it was 45, mind you, it's 45 mile per hour to this day for passenger trains. He hit it at 85. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> so he's got the Southern Crescent <laughs> doing 85 miles an hour around through a 45 mile an hour curve. <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> but it wasn't nothing back then. You know, the guys would hit 110. They'd hit straightaways and hit it if they were running late. You know, that was their job to get the train back on schedule. Really? You think they'd get going that fast? Yes. Oh, yes. I asked him one day. I said, well, what does it feel like to go? 110 miles an hour on he said well no different than 75 once you pass 75 it feels the same wow <laughs> i'll tell you a story about me myself uh, i was when i was training to be an engineer um we had i was on this job and uh, working with a guy we had two sd60s on an auto rack train and uh, we we have some places that are actually true miles where you can check your speedometer and what you do is you check it with a stopwatch and you can once you go past the mile post you hit your stopwatch and if you're running 60, it should take you exactly 60 seconds to, right. to the mile post, correct? So for some reason, that speedometer on this SD60 wouldn't go over 45. And so I told the engineer, you know, I'm up there with him. I said, I, this speedometer's not going over 45. And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, just run like you were going uh, what you think the speed should be. And I said, okay. So we're going downhill, and I've got these auto racks moving, buddy. I've got them moving. We get to the bottom, and he said, you know how fast you're running? I said, no. He said, 70. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> I knew they'd do 70. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that nowadays, though. With a PTC, uh, a computer actually runs a train now for you. They can they can hit autopilot, and the, the thing will run itself. And And are you a fan of that or not a fan of PTC? Well, that's one reason why I like to work these locals. I don't have to deal with it as much. Uh, they, although they are starting to show up on the uh, engines like I run, the uh, PTC is good when it's working properly. You can actually, uh, it shows you a track track diagram. It, it can actually show you what the signals are displayed before you even get to the signal. So um, in a case where you have a long train and the dispatcher is not going to be able to um, run you and it, they tell you uh, over the radio, I'm going to have to hold you at this location because I got an opposing movement coming your way or whatever. And you don't want to block any crossings. Uh, you want to try to fit the, if you can, try to fit the train between crossings. So you'll stop short of a crossing, but you won't be able to see the next signal. And so you don't know when to bring the train around whenever the dispatcher is ready for you. With PTC, it'll show up on your computer screen. Oh, he just changed the signal. Now I've got a signal. Now I know it's safe to go around there. You still have to go around there looking out for a signal, but at least you know right. you're out to go around. Before, you know, you'd be toning up the dispatcher on the radio. Let me know when it's, it's okay to bring my train around because I've stopped short of these crossings to keep from blocking the crossings. You sound like you just love railroading. It's in my blood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bruce and Ralph, it, it's cool talking to a guy that loves railroading this much. You can just, okay. just just hear the passion. Oh yeah, it, you want to talk about uh, something that's it's just hard to explain without experiencing for yourself. Is um, years ago when we used to, like I said, run those GP sixties on our intermodals. Um, we ran a lot of uh, trailer on flat car back. We ran a lot of spine cars then. You know where you have the UPS trailers, and, right? And everything now it's all double stacked they give them a better rate to double stack it so but back then you know you'd run the GP, gp 60s and and they could really haul the mail so we we had one train 214 that came out of atlanta and it went over up to rutherford pennsylvania hauled a lot of ups fedex all that kind of stuff on it anyway um we left out right ahead of the northbound amtrak crescent um and we could out i could outrun that thing <laughs> to Greenville <laughs> with those GP 60s because they would go 60 miles an hour uphill <clears throat> where most engines would just start slowing down. They, we had two trains, uh, train 212 and 204. And back then, uh, before the Conrail merger, um, 212 went to Croxton, Indiana, or Croxton, uh, New Jersey. And um, it had to have Conrail locomotives on it because the state of P Pennsylvania required all locomotives lead locomotives to be equipped with a flushable toilet and huh. at the time now get this is this is true story at the time norfolk southern so frugal they're the frugal railroad their engines did not have a flushable toilet on it all we had was a urinal and the other thing we had was a bucket with a garbage bag on a norfolk southern engine <laughs> in the nose <laughs> But anyway, so state of Pennsylvania said, no, that engine cannot, NS engine cannot lead through the state of Pennsylvania. So 204 went to Alexandria, um, Virginia, right there at Washington, D.C. So it, it would have the three, three GP60s. 212 would have two Conrail, either SD60s or D uh, Conrail Dash 8 wide cab locomotives. 212 would leave out ahead of 204 with those two big six axle 4,000 horsepower Conrail locomotives 204 coming out about 30 45 minutes behind it with the three GP 60s would actually pass that train they would actually catch up and pass it before it got to Greenfield because <laughs> they would be those GP 60s would just be eating their lunch right yeah I, I told the, the dispatcher, I said, I guess it looks like Pac-Man coming up behind it, you know, chomping the blocks right behind that train. As they were, and just running those engines, you know, coming through there, that, that, that's some running right there. Um, bringing a hot shot 211 South, uh, racing in front of the morning Amtrak. Because you had, uh, with a piggyback train, it's like uh, containers are just like people on an airplane. they got to make connections. And so... Um, you imagine 
that that train's got to make it in Atlanta by a certain time in order to make connections to a, a, either either they need to the UPS trailers need to be grounded and taken to the UPS distribution center to be delivered to customers, or they need to make connections to another train. And if it's delayed um, for whatever reason, they're going to miss their connections. And so it was very important to keep those trains running on schedule. And to this day, that's why some people on Amtrak don't understand <laughs> these. Some of these trains are going to run. Right. Uh, and, uh, I was just going to say, Spoon, put your microphone on so I can introduce you to Tim because Spoon has just stumbled into the studio because I forgot to lock the door with all our carrying on from before. I, I was taking out the garbage. Yeah, you haven't, you haven't got your microphone on. I don't. No, you. I, I I hear him. I hear him great. Well, yeah, but I, it's not the silky smooth tones he has when he has his microphone on properly. Yeah, I do have my. I have my microphone on. Is it turned on on the on the? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure enough. Yep. All right. Okay. So, uh, Tim. Yes. Garland, uh, a locomotive engineer for the Norfolk Southern. Meet Mike, uh, the Spoon Oster Tag from Green Bay, Wisconsin, home of the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field, who is a <laughs> locomotive engineer for the Canadian National Railway. All right, all right. Hi, Tim. How you doing? Good to good to see somebody in the Brotherhood. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> so, uh, Spoon, why didn't you answer my messages before? But we were going to be interviewing Tim tonight. What's going on there in your life? Um, I've been pretty busy planning a graduation party and trying to get things squared away for that so i haven't had a lot of basement computer time lately right. so we weren't good enough one. yeah we weren't good enough so uh are you planning were... pre-cooked burgers for this no yeah. i'm actually yeah. i'm actually yeah. sat, uh, saturday i'm smoking 30 pounds of pork uh, pork oh all right, so, uh, Tim, here's my last big question for you. I think we're going to talk to you. If we end up cutting this short, I'll come back to you in a couple of months because this will be probably broadcast towards the end of September, 1st of October. So, uh, we uh, Spoon, we ran into – Spoon, don't turn your mic off. Uh, we ran into quite a bit of uh, technical problems, so we got a late start with Tim. But this guy is a true railroader uh, like yourself. So uh, the last question I'm gonna thing I want to talk to you, Tim, about is your YouTube channel because you really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. The YouTube channel for me has been what the push I need to um, keep my layout going. I do a monthly update uh, video at the end of each month, and knowing that that last day of the month is coming up, it pushes me to get projects done so I'll, I'll i'll keep a rolling list of different projects on the layout that i want to work on and uh, i don't always get a, everything completed during the month but i'll do whatever i can and um then i can show the folks hey this is what i've done this month and i like to say the day job i have is just research for my layout because i i'll look and see i'll look and say wow you know that that in real life i'll say that's I need to simulate that uh, way that that rock cut looks or or way these houses, you know, or the weeds or how this I try to look and pay attention to nature and and what things look like next to the tracks. Um, and um, I want to try to pull that off in my modeling. And uh, I don't know always how to get there. So I'll, I'll do research. You know, I follow others. You know, I have people like uh, Pele Soborg or Mike Confalone. Tom Klamoski has been a tremendous help to me. Lance Mindheim, uh, Mindheim, uh, I follow these guys, and, and I've learned so much from them, and I try to use what they're teaching in my own modeling efforts. What's that Tom Klamoski guy really like? I mean, seriously, you can tell us because nobody's listening. <laughs> yeah, Tom's great. He, he's great. He's come down, and he he appreciates the, the way I like to um, – way i like to run my trains and i i do him we we've you know we've helped each other he helps me out with scenery and things like that and i've helped him out from prototype information how they would do on the prototype instead of since we model if you i would tell anybody if you model the post caboose era then really you're in the computer era and 
real conductors don't walk around with car card and way bills in their back pocket. <laughs> they don't even walk, the only time you'll see a conductor with a way bill is if it's a hazmat way bill that he needs to have on him. Um, no, they operate off of switch list and um, wheel reports and, and uh, work orders and stuff like that. So, so I wanted to do the same for my model layout. But, um, try to make things simple. Keep it a little simpler than what they do out in real life, but something similar. And uh, so I've okay. had time out with that. What is it about Mike Confalone that's uh, caught your eye? Oh, Mike's uh, efforts. He, he, whenever, whenever I see somebody that's pulled something off that looks like what I see in real life, uh, that's, I appreciate that so much. And Mike is one of those uh, freelance model railroads, the Allagash, um, is so believable. It's, it's, he's, he's right there. Uh, he's above, you know, the, the, the Utah belt or Virginia and Ohio and all that, you know, he's, he's, he's made it, he's made it to that plateau where he's developed a freelanced railroad that's completely conceivable. And that's what I strive for my seaboard central to be. So how did, how did you start the YouTube channel? Why did you start it? When did you start it? Well, I sure. saw what other I saw what others were doing, and I thought, you know what, I, mean, I can do this. And uh, it's just like anything taking on modeling. You know, you just you uh, you say, you know what, you need to jump in the pool. You know, um, don't uh, whether it's doing scenery, doing weathering, or whatever. You need to just jump in. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And, and I tell people, you know what, I'm not trying to make money off the thing. It's just a way for me to. Um, share my love of the hobby yeah for sure for sure so how long have you been doing it hmm five years oh really oh, okay yes. cool and you got three thousand subscribers yeah a little over three thousand yeah uh, and and uh and it's good they got some regulars what i have found out that uh from my little research is most people unless it's super interesting most people don't want to tune into something too long they'll they'll tune out after seven minutes um we so, find, yeah, we find that with the podcast after about so what a, minute, I, yeah. after a minute or two. <laughs> what, I, what I found, what I've wanted to start doing probably next month is uh, instead of just doing one 14 or 15 minute long video at the end of the month, I thought about uh, breaking it up and doing a uh, doing one in the middle of the month where I can uh, just do some kind of how to because I get a lot of requests. How did you weather this car? How do you weather these cars or how did you do this? Or I thought, you know what, I can try to do something like that uh, short and sweet and and then uh, at the end of the month, show what, you know, the update, the layout update, and, and let it focus more on operations. And and uh, a lot of people like to see the trains operating. All right, last question. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite question. I ask it to everybody. People are tired of me asking it. Uh, the hobby, growing or dying? Growing. Just growing. Uh, you have a lot of young people that are in it now. A lot, uh, it's, it's a lot more exposure. Yeah, for yes. uh, with, uh, social media. Wow, it's you can see it. Uh, I've looked at the 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 average age of the people that are are my subscribers. That uh, and at, it, most of the people are around my age are between thirty and 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 fifty years old. That's the biggest block. Uh, the next biggest block might be um, the twenty to thirty range, and then after that, it's the people that's that's uh, over fifty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think uh, that social media is going to make the hobby explode. Well, uh, there's a lot of people that they, that are that are in that middle age group or that uh, that 30 to 50 year range that uh, that are in the hobby now. A lot more than people realize. Absolutely. The hobby is going to explode, and we're all going to be covered in Ralph Railroad Goop. Yep. Exactly. Model Railroad Goop. All right. So uh, just before we wrap this up. So Spoon, let me get this straight, just so I'm I'm clear on what happened here. I sent you a yes. I sent you a message quite a few days ago about we were going to be interviewing Tim Garland. I got yeah. a I got a thumbs up from Bruce, the moderately agitated mailboy, pretty quickly. And I got uh, and I got nothing from you. And now you've showed up at the end of the interview. So what what does all this indicate? My my complete lack of uh, preparation and understanding of scheduling <laughs> that a boy 
Yeah. That's a pretty good answer. Uh, no, was that was that, that tough? Yeah, exactly. Just, does he get extra points for that? No, just, no, no. just tell well, him that, you're yeah, just tell him you're good. running on railroad time. No, there is there is no such thing as railroad time on the AML <laughs> network. There is <laughs> Lionel's time and yeah, that's true. Lionel's time. Yeah, that's true. I yeah. can accept that. And if you're if if you are not on time when Lionel <laughs> says to be on time, then don't bother. Yeah, you, Mike, you forgot something. There's Lionel's time, ish. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I forgot about the ish. There's always the always the infamous ish. But yes, I have, I apologize wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, I'll go back by my dish and I'll lay down there and wait for my penance. <laughs> and well, if it was, if you're, if you're planning, if you're planning graduation parties and looking after your family, family becomes, comes before the AML network. Yes. Yes, it, it should. It should. Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah, but e even when you're, uh, would it have killed you to go? I'm not available. I mean, come on, seriously. You just Bruce and I were sitting around all day. Bruce, Bruce, seriously, yes. seriously. Now, I want you to tell the absolute truth about this, okay? Okay. You and I were sitting around. We met t today around 10 a.m. Yeah. At the local coffee shop, and we, we sat. Did. We sat there with our phones, looking at our phones, yeah. anxiously waiting to see if we got a message from Spoon. We were looking at our phones like every 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Checking the Facebook pages. And like It was like, well, well, what's up? Is he coming or not coming? And, and we put down about, what, seven, eight, oh, nine, yeah. maybe I, ten, I, ten, ten donuts I, each. I, 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 can, I can guarantee this will be the last, the very, very last um, non-response <laughs> show up that i will ever do i i apologize i i am sorry i am not worthy of uh, everything uh uh tim mm -hmm. you're not gonna start crying are you spoon no absolutely not no I'm okay not good I, I, I just hoping you hadn't gone over the edge or something uh, no i'm not, no better than that <laughs> <laughs> Tim, seeing as how both you and Spoon are lifelong railroaders, uh, in your uh, in your uh, experience, Tim, as a lifelong uh, Norfolk Southern guy, is this pretty much the way all Canadian national guys are? Well, it just kind of reminds me of, uh, we'll, for instance, we have a customer that'll call us, what, what time are you going to be at our place? And we'll say, oh, we're, we're going to be there around 1230. And it's actually 130 when we actually show up. So that's why I asked oh, him if he was on railroad time. <laughs> 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 that's the way it always is an hour whatever we tell you it's gonna be an hour later <laughs> all right hey bruce can you give out our email address yes please and thank you we'll get we'll hustle yeah. out of here and then we'll do the kelly questions okay our email address is uh uh, uh oh yeah email address <laughs> modeler's life modelers with one l modeler's life at gmail.com and uh we have a website if you go to our website, amodelerslife.com, there's all kinds of stuff there. Tell you all kinds of things about our our uh, our podcast. And right now, I'm going to look for I'm look, don't and everybody somebody Tim tell a story about railroading. About railroading. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and tell a story about railroading. I'm looking for something on the computer, even though even though we're incredibly organized, I'm looking for something on the computer. Insert mm. elevator music here. Yeah, no, no, we can't have any more ele elevator music. We've had enough elevator music. We were over a quote of elevator music. I'll yeah. tell okay. you, Lionel, the uh, scale trains event that we just went to. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's well, how we. Go. That's how we first met in the in the we first met person. Met in person up there on that. Actually, the engineer on the Hawassi run, uh, Brian Hunt. He and I worked worked at Six Flags together. Oh really. Yeah, he, um, we both ran the train, and Brian, they actually hired Brian on as a mechanic uh, to work full-time on the locomotives, and he ended up taking that experience and getting hired full-time with the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. So now he's able to work on the 630 and the 4501 and, and all the diesels up there. So, that's so how come you didn't get a cab ride? <laughs> well, they've offered, when I've been up there before, they've offered a cab ride. A better... Uh, it, more importantly, 
why didn't you get me a cab ride? <laughs> and actually, the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum has that first diesel locomotive I ever ran. That the guy that uh, took me on that trip up to Dalton, Georgia at the time, they had a, a old Southern Railway GP38. Now, I'll never forget, uh, it was still in Southern tuxedo paint. And underneath the cab, it said John E. Shambliss. And he was the vice president of the TAG Railway, the Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. Oh, yeah. And they actually re the NS donated that locomotive uh, to the TVRM, and TVRM repainted that engine up into its original uh, blue livery. Cool. So that's pretty cool seeing that that first engine I ever ran, and, and actually Atlas made a HO scale model of it that I have on my layout. All right. uh, what are you filing, Ralph? I'm not filing anything. Uh, I was, spoon. I was. Oh I my was, God! Sorry. Give me a break! <laughs> oh, for crying out loud! Shows up late, just takes over <laughs> like the only one. Send... It was me. So, doesn't send us. A, doesn't answer our messages. Shows up late, and then we can hear him filing away while we. Have you ever been oh, on the you know, podcast? You know what? I bet he's working on his caboose model. No, I think I cannot believe you are. Fi you show up and then you're. Fi <laughs> And you know what? Right about now, you're driving up. You're driving either to or from work, listening to this. And don't you <laughs> laughing? And laugh don't it? don't you feel ashamed right now? Right? You know what? Take a picture wherever you are right now and put it posted on, on the uh, on the page. <laughs> pull over. Pull over. Slow down. Signal. Put on that right signal. Slow down. And make sure the shoulder doesn't drop off. And get out and get out of the truck. <laughs> and take a selfie of yourself standing in front of your pickup truck. <laughs> oh, bonus shots is there's a cruiser with lights on me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I actually, I actually, to be perfectly honest with you, I actually was working on the caboose. Oh, wow. Ah! <laughs> All right, Tim. So, uh, uh, yeah, we've heard enough of you. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, Tim, at the appropriate moment, uh, you have to say happy rails to you. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Well, Tim, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say happy rails to you. Modeler's Life is sponsored by Big Ass Main Potatoes. If you've got a main potato, you've got a big ass. It's another Lincoln Homer. Oh, this guy's going to be great on the Kelly questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>